Good afternoon, everyone. Well, good afternoon, UK time anyway. My name is David Evans. I chair the Hazardous Industries Group and would like to welcome you to the uh, latest of our webinars. Uh, just before we uh, start, I'd like to just mention a couple of things about uh, the group. Um, we're always interested in uh, having contacts back from our members and from others interested in the hazardous industries. We're pulling together a newsletter in the next month or so. So anybody who's got some good stories, examples, would like to share experiences that they've had, we would really welcome uh, that. And um, just to say that we're also welcoming a new committee member in the next uh, few weeks, Andy Morris of uh, Cadent. And on that subject, we continue to look for people with different backgrounds who'd like to get engaged with the committee so please just look out for emails that will be coming out from, uh, from IH. I think that's enough from the Hazardous Industries Group, but please do follow our, our LinkedIn pages. We do quite a lot of publication there and we do operate the, uh, the Twitter side. What I'd like to do today though, is to uh, welcome uh, Dilip Arapan. Uh, Dilip has uh, agreed to give us a, uh, talk on what in the UK we refer to as DZEA, the Dangerous Substances and Explosive Atmospheres Regulations. These have been in place for a number of years, 2002 if my memory uh, serves, but of course they're applicable to a wide area. Let's forget that they're based on UK regulation, but let's also look at the fact that most uh, countries have similar forms of reg regulation and I hope you find it interesting, the, uh, the background. Dilip is an associate process safety member with the uh, ICAP as well as being part of uh, IOSH. Over seven years of uh, process safety and consulting experience covering defense, aviation, chemical, petrochemical, oil and gas. And he is somebody with international experience having been based in the EU, Asia Pacific and the Middle East region. So I'd like to hand over to welcome you to this just a final reminder please do use the q a section post us some questions because we will be selecting them at the end i hope to have 10 or 15 minutes to raise some of the interesting issues that uh, that dilip is about to bring up that's enough from me so dilip over to you sir Hi, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon and good morning and good evening for international audience. Thank you for joining us today and taking your time to understand briefly on uh, this year, as David has already introduced, uh, which is in the UK and in Europe, we call it as uh, ATEX. So let's jump on to the presentation straight away. So myself, Dilip Barulapan, I'm a principal process engineer with EEUK Group and having a background in chemical engineering and loss prevention. As do we have a short amount of time, it's all about 40 minutes. And I have tried to manage and compile as much as I could. And also, if you have any questions, please feel free to pop in your question into QA and we shall be able to pick one after another. If not, I think we could also publish the question and answer in the websites or LinkedIn page. Thank you. So today's contents are, we will briefly go through introduction on legislation and understanding explosion and flammability data, hazardous area classification for gases and dust separately, and what could we do to prevent an explosion by avoiding ignition sources, and what is basis of safety and how it is uh, the key for avoiding an explosion or primary or secondary and also an EMS. Finally, this is an important section and why you should do review this year slash ATEX and when. Right. As we all know, the ATEX Directive 114, uh, which replaces 95, it came into uh, the year 1995 and the, it's, it's focusing on two things that is, it, it gives us information on what is uh, a flammable substances. Anything as the definition says, it's mixture with air under atmospheric condition on flammable substance in the form of gaseous vapor mist or dust, which after an ignition has occurred, combustion spreads to the entire unburnt mixture, right? And that comes in Article 2, ATEX 114 later, which was replaced in ATEX 153. 
So I'm just running through this in, uh, legislation because it is not relevant to a non-European or UK uh, attendees. So formally referred as ATEX 137, which came in 1999, on the minimum requirements for improving safety and health protection of workers potentially at risk from explosive atmosphere. And again, these are the three important information that we have to keep in mind, i.e. to prevent the formation of explosive atmosphere where nature of activity does not allow, right? And also we have to look, if we cannot prevent an explosive atmosphere, then we have to look for situation, how can we avoid ignition source coming in contact with the atmosphere and mitigate the detrimental effects of an explosion so as to ensure the health and safety of the workers. This is what the, the articles 153 came and, and it has clearly indicated that what is essential to do and to fulfill uh, the desire uh, regulations by an employer. Intention of desire states to provide uncoherent controlling risk from substances. I know we all know that substances, that is flammable substances, could also be oxidizing explosive. And today, this year also covers corrosives and compressed gases. That's why in recent industry, uh, all the corrosives uh, which goes through the pipelines are also stored uh, within the flammables, the warehouses, uh, guidelines are there to keep them separate in isolated area. Compressed gases where propane and also the cylinders that we use for forklifts that fall under this year. Controlling work activities involving other substances that could create fire and explosion or similar energetic, it could be runaway reaction, like the composition or unstable substances, also dust explosions, they are coming under this year intentions. We, there is always a question in industry and in the market where we've been to uh, client discussions or an you know, on-site. What is the minimum requirement? No, this year doesn't give you a minimum requirement, i.e. like stating out if you have a five liter or if you use 10 kilo of uh, powders or dust. No, there is no such minimum requirements uh, mentioned in the guidelines that whether you, you are excluded uh, to perform a this year assessment but there are some information do mentioned in the guidance stating that for hazardous area classification purpose. Let's see what are these. What is required to achieve disease compliance? Well, potentially we have to identify where explosive atmosphere could occur, perform and record risk assessment, ensure equipment in zoned areas is suitable for use, and we have to obtain necessary flammability data. Flammability data we will see in separate section, but it, it could be either uh, in the, uh, the flash points or auto ignition temperature, or if it is for dust, what is my ignition point? What is the minimum ignition energy, right? These are the information we have to obtain. Generally, it comes with the safety data sheet. If it is not, then we have to perform required testing in the laboratory with the approved service provider. Ensure standard operating procedure are in place, provide training to all the aspects of this year, audit, ensure the continuity of compliance. This is of the this year, uh, the, the documents and looks in part 17 sections. If you all can download the, uh, the, uh, the standards which are available in internet, I will show shortly the, the link for them. One to 17, the most important is number seven, eight, nine, and also we have number 10, and five, which are pretty much important to understand uh, how do we carry out the disease risk assessment. There are uh, sufficient information that would help us to understand uh, in a detailed manner. What is dangerous substances? As we are all uh, technicians, we know what is dangerous substances. Basically anything is flammable or combustible or which has a low boiling point, they are considered as flammables and uh, dangerous substances and the way they are handled, stored, and uh, moved within the process industry. Basically, this information we could find it in CLP uh, within the product when you have a safety data sheet or during transfer. Documentation for DZIA. So, Regulation 5 and, and in DZIA and our ATEX Articles 4 and 8, CAD, that is Chemical Agents Directive for industry will mostly use and manufacture an R&D chemicals, article number four states, it is necessary to record significant findings of risk assessment as soon as practicable after the assessment is made. This does not have to be in the form of separate explosion protection document, 
and people who's coming from coma background that is working in the coma industry would understand what is EPD can be integrated into MHSW risk assessment as we are all aware written record only if there are five or more employees in the premises so a desire assessment and record and the report is necessary and it is legal when you have more than five employees or on present on site if it is less than that you may ask do i have to have a uh, desire assessment yes you need to perform a desire assessment even in order to conform its non-hazardous or a safe area to work so as i mentioned these are uh, some guidelines is you can uh, refer to uh, uh, the desire regulations and information right from L133 to L138 to the latest update. You can find these resources in hseuk.gov.uk slash fire and explosion at resources. Some, some uh, pages and links in the dodgy websites will also give access to these, but I think if you, if you follow the hse.gov.uk, you'll get a recent update and um, changes to the regulations and amendments. So hazardous area classification. Before going into hazardous area classification or any form of technical things, I would like to say here, Desir is giving us three things, right? One, how can we avoid formation of flammable atmosphere? And second, how can I avoid ignition sources? And third, if I can't avoid flammable atmosphere or avoid ignition sources, then if I have an explosion or primary or secondary on EMS, how I'm going to safeguard. So this is called basis of safety to understand that we have to classify the areas as hazardous, i.e. where potentially an atmosphere can present. So for gases, we're going to see that now. Regulation 7 slash 1 in this year states, this year requires that a place where explosive atmospheres may occur are classified into hazardous and non-hazardous places must be classified into zones schedule 2 gives the definition of hazardous hazardous means the special precautions are needed to protect health safety of workers there are five steps we could perform an hazardous area classification we have to obtain data we have to identify the sources of release of any materials that would come into contact say uh, materials from a tank form there could be a leak right that could be a 1 mm or 2 mm or full bore rupture if it is a silo, you, during handling or tanker loading or unloading, there could be a leak underneath the silo house from your rotary wall. It could be a leak from your screw conveyor, right? So these kind of, we have to identify source of release potentially in normal and abnormal condition. And also we have to assign the grade of release, as I mentioned, what the condition it is leaking. Say, uh, because fueling your uh, forklift, right? It's, it's, it's a part of normal operation. So whenever you fuel it, there could be a potentially a small amount of leak from your flanges. That's part of operation. But we do not expect to have a leak uh, from a pipeline, right, from a process vessel to another process vessel. So that's an abnormal condition. So we have to assign the grade of release, assign the zone numbers and extension of the zone and record and document. For a good hazardous data classification team, we need to have multidimensional team, right? A competent person who understands the hack the principles and philosophy behind hazardous area classification, and also who understand the regulations quite better with a bit more engineering background with multidisciplinary alongside. They need to have a plant engineer, electrical project, plant manager, and contractor. So what is zone zero? So zone zero is nothing but a vapor or uh, the flammable atmosphere is continuously present for a longer period or frequently, i.e. during normal operation condition. So one of the example can be a tank form. The alleged area inside a tank is zone zero because you expect to have vapor present continuously. Or it could be sump and in a tank form, like you know, in a, where you expect to have a leak or constantly materials are always stored in there. So it's zone zero there. So zone one is likely to occur in normal operation. We could call it as, uh, say, uh, in in zone one from your uh, pressure vessel in, in your tank form when you have uh, your relief valve it is expected to have a constant relief there so it is part of normal operation designed to relieve the pressure that would potentially build up so any vapor and zones that come say 1.5 meter uh, around the pressure wall is zone one zone two 
technically there if it is a gaseous uh, area the vapors you would have a dispersion from zone one leading to zone two or if there is a leak from your flanges 0 0.5 meter from your flanges uh, in across all the directions and to impedance floor level depends on if the vapor is heavier or lighter you will give zone two which will not not likely to occur in normal operation but if it does that normally will process for a short period isn't it we do have maintenance team to act upon immediately so this is how basically the zone drawings look like zone zero one and two and show zones on site plans to scale plain views as minimum include temperature class and gas group all our subsection example calculations made to determine the zone sometimes if it is a pressure storage vessel or a pressurized pipeline uh, basic guidelines is, uh, from the standards will not give us uh, the zone extensions you might have to uh, use softwares to understand the dispersion that would give you the zone so other relevant information as notes so science for hazardous area atx requires hazardous areas to be marked with ex that is explosive atmosphere area this must be done wherever necessary at the entry point science provide information for persons and contractors then they were wicked bit alert that there are something uh, explosives or materials are handed which are potentially hazardous so basically this is the uh, i would i've just made it uh, to understand for my attendees uh, you have to look like where the material can get out how often does it come out most of the time a lot or rarely most of the time is zone zero a lot of the time zone one and rarely that is abnormal condition zone two sometimes abnormal condition can also lead to zone one if it is kept unattended so get the flammability data done get the drawings and procedures find the resources i mean for the release identify the duration the grade of release this is called grade of release this point most of the time a lot of the time bradley right and we have to consider ventilation is it a closed room operation or is it external or is even the closed room operation do we have ventilation is provided what is the rate of ventilation or extraction uh, do we do i have 10 per meter second is it more than the required level so all the information will come into picture to define the zone or the uh, the grade of release and it will give us enough information to assign the zone numbers and estimate the zone size because if you have a, a rate of intra, uh, extraction is more than 10 meter per second and then uh, the zone size could be potentially minimized from zone uh, 2 to zone 1 sorry zone 1 to zone 2 uh, with the zone extension from 1.5 to 0 0.5 meter we have to re report it record it and review it and whenever there is a management of change so these are a couple of uh, standards and regulations en standards quite common in europe and um, and this is a 2005 updated one and ip15 is uh, the energy institute uh, uh, in the uk it's a british energy institute of petroleum and nfe standards uh, for america's uh, where national fire protection association they do have the similar more on everybody every standard gives the same uh, relatively information but uh, the simplified one is en and uh, ip15 as uh, its latest version has given a more uh, clarified and uh, simplified information uh, these uh, links will be shared in your uh, uh, recorded version so you can pick it up from there moving on to the dust the principle behind uh, uh, hazardous area classification for dust is the same the same five five steps obtained data obtain the release where it is coming from how long does it come for and how do i assign the zone but it, since it's dust the nature and the phenomena behind is slightly different right so so it's the same five steps i'm not going to stick around in this slide so obtain data right in order to understand a dust is uh, com uh, combustible right we need to know whether it is combustible or not that will be done by group a or b classification test meaning uh, a report any dust or any powders is classified as group a uh, by a simple test they are combustible if it's group b they are non-combustible however a non-combustible dust if it is being processed in an elevated temperature can also become a combustible dust for example a couple of flowers or a couple of materials that we use in food industry after being through ovens or fluid bed dryers 
they change the uh, nature uh, reaction towards ignition source. Uh, so they become combustible, but the temperature, elevated temperature are meant as 300 to 400 degrees Celsius above that. And we should also know minimum explosive concentration for the dust. So these two information will give us sufficient information whether the, the dust can form a, a combustible uh, atmosphere or not, and what concentration. But this MEC value is subject to discussion uh, because not all the MEC value M concentration remains because dust, we, know, we all know that dust is kind of, kind of a form of cloud, right? When you have a, a movement within the area, so this MEC might get disturbed. Pretty much we can, uh, MEC is more for pharmaceutical industry in a closed room operation or inside a vessel or process bin. And also for equipment selection uh, in dust area, we need to know uh, this MIT or LIT. MIT means minimum ignition temperature. LIT is layer ignition temperature. So these values will determine what equipment to procure and install within the zones uh, because the surface temperature could ignite a dust cloud or a layer temperature could ignite the layer that is settled on top of a motor or, uh, or a, a conveyor uh, vessels. So bulk powder volume resistivity is more of physical property um, that well, what is the resistivity reaction towards the settlement of powder. Again, likewise, I've seen discussed for gas and vapor, the zone's concept is pretty much same, uh, present continuously normal and abnormal or not likely to occur, but uh, the zone numbers are different. That is zone 20, 21, 22. Here for dust, whereas for gas, it's zero, one, and two. Inside dust handling equipment, right? Zone 20, a silo. A silo can constantly have zone 20 because during loading or unloading, we disturb the dust that's present with inside and you have a mixture of dust inside a dust collector system, right? Your hand handling or pneumatic uh, filter bag shakes. And during shaking that you create a dust cloud inside and there is a constant air transfer inside. So inside a dust collector system or inside a silo, it's zone 20. <clears throat> inside some equipment, typically up to one meter from the source. So zone 21 say some process vessels, like you have a day bin, like you know process bin. You collect the material from silo, you process it and store it for a while and then supply it to the, the, the next process. So there, the, the dust cloud is expected to uh, stay for a certain amount of period. And also tipping station, when an operator is tipping, uh, is introducing uh, additives into a mixture, into a grinder, right? Those open tipping stations with an extraction of hood on the top would also come under zone 21 because they are, the zone cloud stays there for a small amount of period. They don't stay continuously as you would see in a uh, silo or a dust collectors. Zone 22, typically one meter from the source. So again, it, this could be a leakage from your FIBCs, a leakage from any form of transfer uh, uh, pipelines and uh, the whose connections of your materials dust. So we can also consider practical considerations. And uh, that's why, as I mentioned in the past, and operators will play a vital role in a hazardous area classification team because he knows where the leaks generally occur within the facility. So typical uh, zones for dust looks like this. And this is what I was talking about. Imagine this figure, first figure as a tipping station, right? An operator stand is standing here in the platform, tips the material into this uh, tipping uh, mixture, and the material goes through this rotary wall. However, since he is tipping here, you have an extraction hood, this part, but there is a potential for the cloud to escape and settle until the imperious floor level. And inside of this tipping machine, uh, tipping equipment, you have the dust that is zone one, and this is zone, sorry, zone 21 and zone 22. And it goes until the extraction unit, till the dust collector. And here below the rotary wall, you will still have zone 21 because the dust is still acting on it present in it. Looking at this figure, and I'm, um, usually I used to ask questions, but this is not an interactive session. Let me just tell you. So this is on the top of a bin in a facility, right? And this flexible uh, coupling, it has a leak. That's where the dust is escaping. And look, it's all spreaded across the top of it. And as per our discussion here, 
not likely to occur in a normal operation, but if does occur, will persist for a short period. This is what it is. It doesn't expect, we doesn't expect to have leak in the normal operation condition. However, this has created a leak and you have leak full of dust in zone 22. Um, and, you know, when the management of change occurs or the maintenance team monitor it, they will remove it with an ATX rated vacuum cleaner. You should not brush or clean with the brooms or any form of a brush because you are creating a dust cloud, i.e. flammable atmosphere. So this situation should be handled or dealt with and vacuum cleaner, which is ATEC certified to be used in an appropriate zone, that is 21 or 22. We do not use ATEC rated vacuum cleaner inside a silo or dust collectors, right? So drying looks like this, pretty much the same concept. Zone 20, 24 and 22, it is as per the gases and vapor, the symbols are the same. And we have to review whenever there is a requirement, there is a change in uh, management or materials. So we are going to the important section, basis of safety. How do we prevent an explosion, right? And how can we protect? Not, we are not going to protect an explosion, means how do we protect the, the workers and the facility uh, from an explosion that would occur. So again, I would like to repeat the three things. Avoidance of flammable atmosphere, avoid ignition source, and protect or prevent the explosion. So that is called basis of safety. So all the effects, if measures that we take in our facility, they falls under these three umbrellas, right? So you might have extraction system, you might have a ventilation, right? They are there to avoid flammable atmosphere. You might have an extraction, LEV uh, in your dust handling area. That's for number one, basis of safety, avoidance of flammable atmosphere. We would have come across number of ATEX equipments, right? And they are there to avoid ignition sources. But is that only electrical equipments are giving ignition source? No, there are static. There are mechanical, there are frictional, right? There are impact spark. So there are several ignition sources that we would come across. And then finally, we will see how do we protect and prevent explosion from spreading to neighboring process. What is basis of safety? The combination of measures relied upon ensure safety. For instance, a basis of safety highlights those aspects of design, hardware protective systems and procedure that are safety critical, i.e process safety, critical equipments or informations. So it can be only selected in all three significant hazards that have been identified and evaluated. Three, namely, explosion prevention, avoidance of ignition sources, explosion protection. This is what I've been telling as basis of safety. Basic of explosion prevention, we can avoid the fuel, right? If the fuel is the product, then we can remove the oxygen present around the fuel meaning it will not give you a flammable atmosphere, right? And <clears throat> we can now work outside the flammable range. What is the flammable range? Yes, so your, any product will have their flammable range. Like I mentioned, for gases and vapors, this inform everybody is quite aware of the gases and vapors flammable range, LEL and UFL. But however, for dust, right? If you take the flammable range is, it is a maximum explosive concentration. So we could reduce a concentration by how? by minimizing the oxygen presence. So what can we do? We can have an oxygen analyzer inside your process equipment to understand what range of oxygen is required to create a flammable atmosphere. And we can eliminate all the ignition sources. How do we know what are the ignition sources? Yes, if this, can be, this can be derived from your ignition sensitivity data for dust, uh, that is uh, explosion, uh, prob uh, properties of flammable properties of your dust or powders. We can remove oxygen, as I mentioned, by inerting, right? How do we inert? What is the, uh, uh, the amount of nitrogen required? So that information will come from LOC, limiting oxygen concentration information. This can be determined uh, uh, by performing uh, tests in the laboratories. So by this, we can prevent uh, an explosion, right? Because you're avoiding the fuel. Fuel means what? Uh, the, any materials that uh, gives a, a base for an explosion to happen, right? So we can remove the product. We cannot remove the product, okay. Then we can work outside its flammable range and remove the ignition sources or remove the oxygen. So it, it never be a flammable material. 
and the second one is avoid the fuel right how can we avoid the fuel we cannot avoid the fuel meaning fuel is the product but we can look for alternatives instead of uh, instead of using uh, oxyacetylene right we can go for argon based uh, materials in your welding workshops to use removing the fuel that's how we look for avoid the fuel how can we so we can keep the safety uh, margin of temperature like uh, to work below the flush point for example uh, uh, to keep the seven five degrees celsius as a safety margin which is quite relatively difficult uh, in the weather here uh, in, sorry easy in the uk and europe but however people from uh, middle east or uh, in asia pacific is quite difficult to work below the safety margin because the temperature there usually is 35 plus Avoidance of flammable and explosive concentration, right? We can dilute by providing fresh flow of air um, uh, within the facilities, and that can be monitored. We have standards here for each areas of what the air change is required. <clears throat> or we can provide local exhaust ventilation that, uh, uh, by forced ventilation, and uh, by, by means this, we can avoid uh, the flammable materials that could settled as pocket gases or can stay as a cloud um, around the process areas. So purging, as I mentioned, uh, removal of oxygen, right? There are two methods. You can use displacement purging or pressure swing purging. Um, this, this, this will help us to avoid the oxygen presence. So as we mentioned that we need two things to uh, for form a flammable atmosphere. Not necessarily you have to focus on removing the fuel that is the material but if you try to avoid the oxygen presence, uh, that could also uh, minimize um, or reduce our, uh, the potential of flammable atmosphere presence. The fine, third one is, and final one is removal of fuel, right? Secondary dust explosion. Look at the leaks, right? Remove means like, how can I remove the fuel in this means? So by housekeeping, uh, regressive housekeeping and, uh, and also uh, good engineering practices, uh, could help you to remove a fuel. So this is coming from this conveyor, screw conveyors. There's a screw conveyors uh, and also belt conveyor from going from your, from this uh, bin uh, coming from outside silo. But constant leaks, that's a piled amount of starch. It's, it's, it, this is uh, settled and it is overlooked by staff because this, this takes like days and days to form uh, this, uh, this shape for the dust to come from multiple leaks, one, two, three, four. Right, and that's that's that gives more uh, information how uh, the housekeeping in dusty environment is uh, important because the these leads to secondary explosion. If a small leaks or a flash fire to occur inside the conveyor, and if that will uh, increase the temperature, and this can also uh, disturb the dust settle and create a dust cloud, and this can be a continuous reaction causing a secondary explosion kind of this 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 kind of leaks or situation more than explosion can also cause to uh, slippery as that and isolating people from earthing and as human can contribute up to 30 millijoule of static electricity and while you walk you create a cloud from the stairs and you also contribute uh, electrostatic energy uh, because starch does do have uh, the mie uh, from uh, without inductance uh, less than 30, so we can definitely ignite the starch cloud. So this is uh, as the first basis of safety, as I mentioned, avoiding uh, flammable atmosphere, right? Uh, that's what we've been saying. How can we avoid flammable atmosphere? We can avoid by removing the fuel, avoiding concentration, or uh, remove the fuel itself. And now we are going into avoidance of ignition source. As per standard EN1127 number one, you can see there are 13 types of ignition sources. I am not going to go uh, into all the 13 types of ignition uh, sources today as we are having quite short amount of time. But however, we should focus on uh, the main uh, the, the ignition sources that we would come across in our day-to-day -day and most common operations. As you know, hot surfaces, right? And that's what, for hot surfaces, as I mentioned, the temperature class of an uh, 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 equipment, right? It could be uh, electrical or mechanical equipment. We need to know what is the temperature uh, class. That is, how, tem how hot the surface could go if the equipment fail or if it's run constantly. Can it go beyond 340? Can it go beyond 450? 
So there are something called temperature class in ATEX regulations. We would see that separately in a future webinar, right? And also we know this basic things, flames, fumes, and naked flame. We do have a hot work permit to avoid this type of ignition sources. Mechanical friction and thermite spark. Mechanical friction is not only by frictional that comes by two mechanical equipment. There are other type of mechanical frictions, namely impact spark. When, for example, uh, when an abrasive metal uh, uh, material goes into your ducting, right? And at the corner of each ducting, the, the mechanical debris could get impact and create smoldering in dust equipment environment. This smoldering uh, of materials and then ignite the dust settled inside the DCU, creating a primary and followed by secondary explosion and then loop of explosion within the facility. So mechanical uh, uh, frictions, electrical apparatus, we all know, uh, people who are all from complex backgrounds, you would have understand latex uh, and electrical equipments more. And uh, these are <coughs> um, uh, uh, ATEX certified equipments will not uh, uh, allow the materials to ingress. Uh, and also they will not uh, have energy that will ignite because that uh, the ignition energy from ATEX rated equipment will not have uh, the ignition value that could ignite a cloud. They are suppressed and minimized ignition. Static electricity is a vast subject and uh, you have you have four or five uh, types of static electricity, uh, brush discharge and uh, 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 you have a propagating brush discharge, cone discharge and spark discharge. So human, whenever we walk uh, by the door and you touch the door handle and then the spark you get is called uh, uh, that is uh, spark discharge uh, and also between two equipment and machineries the discharge comes is also called spark discharge and lightning and exothermic reaction and spontaneous combustion sorry i'm not covering this uh, ignition source topic in much detail because the vast area but these are certain types of ignition sources we have to take into control, uh, sorry, consideration when performing a desired or ATEX assessment. Types of protection, electrical apparatus as mentioned, there are several types, flame proof, increase in safety, intrinsically safety, IA, IB, right? IA is for zone uh, zero and IB for zone uh, one because the level of protection is high. And there are several others for your process requirement. As I mentioned, selection of electrical apparatus for gases and vapors, zone zero required IA mean it has uh, two uh, failures to uh, withstand uh, EXIA equipments. And zone one can have ED, QE, depends on the process as I mentioned. In zone two, any suitable for zone zero and one is, uh, is sufficient, but it's best you use zone one because of cost uh, concern. Uh, zone zero equipments are quite expensive. Um, not slight, but just must slightly expensive. <clears throat> In addition, the maximum surface temperature must be considered. That is, what is the auto ignition temperature and what is the temperature class of the equipment while procuring uh, electrical apparatus for your uh, gases and vapor area. Explosion protection techniques. There are three containment, venting, and suppression, right? But none of the above requires measures to prevent propagation, that is, isolating, right? because containment, we'll see what is, I'll, I'll talk through you later, sorry. Explosion containment. Containment is nothing but just containing the explosion uh, within the vessel because you would be designing uh, an equipment uh, to withstand the pressure. So that information we would be able to uh, generate from the design of the equipment. And also the material has been handled, sorry. And also the material has been handled within the process equipment. What is the maximum pressure, P max of the dust, right? Uh, um, uh, that it required to design so that any explosion comes, the equipment will hold the maximum pressure rise of the particular powders. So vessel strength must be maintained over the life period and uh, we have to replace all the bolts fittings after each maintenance. Strong plant is expensive to build, but again, difficult to operate, but do have advantages because does not release any toxicity if the material is toxic. No worries about provision of safe area because the, uh, the equipment controls the explosion. Second is relief venting. We all know we have come across numbers and types of explosion uh, relief panels uh, day in, day out within our facility. 
but how and what basis this explosion panels are designed that's the question isn't it and so can <clears throat> my explosion panels that i used for flour or uh, sugar uh, can i use it for a pharmaceutical company no you can't because the explosion uh, uh, the explosion severity and the maximum pressure rise of sugar and the api materials are totally different so each uh, explosion panel should be designed according to the requirement of the substance that is going to be handled or installed at so the wind design installation maintenance has many pitfalls for the inexperienced like i said i've seen retrofitting of uh, this explosion panels on an api or active pharma ingredient site or uh, a chemical dry chemical uh, industry uh, where there uh, this design is not at all suitable this could be potentially for sugar or, uh, or flour because all these dust materials are classified according to the severity that is st class one two three that we can discuss in our future webinars about dust explosion explosion suppression we use uh, explosion suppression kit using sodium bicarbonate as soon as any uh, change in pressure inside inside equipment has been triggered the sensor diffuse and they just deploy the powders inside so they just uh, reduce or uh, suppress the explosion and uh, it's quite expensive and but it's very effective but the thing is the materials will be degraded you cannot reuse them you have to isolate remove clean and then restart the process isolation so yes i have explosion venting i have explosion panels but why would i need explosion isolation so imagine a silo or a dust collector unit right if an explosion to occur from a dust collector, your panel will open, the pressure wave will travel in one direction. What about the pressure wave that goes into other uh, direction, right? So uh, if your pressure wave to travel back into the facility, we have to isolate uh, uh, the, the duct line. There are several uh, methods available in isolation. One of the best thing is the rotary wall. If the rotary wall is appropriately designed uh, as per ATEX, then it can act as an isolation under the silo to your process vessel. The rush fast uh, acting wall and pressure set of wall uh, in the duct works that you can design uh, for the uh, pressure raise. So that can act as a explosion isolation device. For gases, we have flame arrester, flashback arrester, NRVs. For dust, we have rapid action wall, rotary walls, explosion diverters, chokes, depends on the material. So coming to the important things, so I hope everybody has understood the basic of uh, desire. Um, so again, I would just like to brush up just for a minute. <clears throat> so desire is nothing but a dangerous substance explosive atmosphere. And what do we need to understand for desire is that uh, we need to know uh, uh, what is the material flammable? Is the material combustible? Okay, it is combustible and flammable on what condition, right? How can I avoid an explosion? First, we have to avoid uh, any situation that would create flammable atmosphere. Second, avoiding ignition source. And third, we have just saw the explosion protection techniques, containment, venting, and suppression. But we have to also, how do we avoid ignition sources? Where should I avoid ignition sources? To that, we need to classify areas, that is hazardous area classifications. So those areas will tell you normal and abnormal condition there could be a potential situation may arise or exist that could cause a flammable situation so those areas are hazardous area classification within that area only you have to avoid ignition source <clears throat> zone 0 1 2 zone 20 21 and 22 so this is what this year on the whole talks about it's basically process safety but in order to make it more regularized and standard this comes in the form of this year And why and when do we need this year? So a systematic review of facility operation with respect to handling flammable substances, usually addressing these three. That's what I mentioned, right? Formation of flammable, presence of effective ignition sources. How do we control? <clears throat> why it is required to ensure the safe operation of facility and legal requirement. AIDS training and awareness for personal insurance sometimes, yeah. It does also complement to your HAZAP studies and layer of protection analysis and still more for functional safety purposes. 
items can be minimized in previous ATEX and this year assessment. Why? Because you know your electrostatic hazard could be overlooked. Dust powders could be overlooked. New process and routine, everything could be overlooked, may not be considered. So that's why it's important to review your existing this year and ATEX. When can I do? Right? When? When there is a management of change. Materials loading and storage, transfer, processing, collection, disposal. Every time when you do a process change or when you have a process, it is absolutely fine that you carry out a review uh, or assessment. A review should be undertaken when there is a change of unit operation. That's what I mentioned. Introduction to new process, examples, standard operating procedure, facility, product change, process flow change is worth that you carry out a desired review if you have an existing desired assessment done. Some examples of desired ATEX review. For example, storage silo, right? New supply of flour is used to an existing silo of storage because the, the properties are different, right? Silo have ATEX rated equipment explosion protection. Is explosion protection suitably designed for the maximum explosion pressure, i.e., that is Pmax, right? So here, if you could see the new flour data sheet, will tell you the maximum concentration is 50 to 100. The Pmax is 6.7 bar, that is. Measured maximum explosion pressure is 6.5. ST class is one, and MIE value is greater than 100 millijoule. So this is the new flower sheet. Then what you need to do for existing silo, <clears throat> we have to review whether my explosion panels and all the earthing systems and everything is matching the new material. If not, you have to uh, re-engineer to fit the purpose. For reactors, there is a process change to occur within the reactor. The temperature of the mixer was increased to increase the reaction rate. Then what do I do, right? If the temperature increase, the pressure increase. If the pressure increase, everything increases in the process. So however, one of the liquid reactants had a flash point below the elevated temperature. So this is what we have to consider. Sometimes we have flash fire or explosion within the reactor for this basic information, right? Then there is a print temperature rise, and we will not, uh, we will fail to look the flash points of one of the reactants is lower than the temperature rise because of increasing the uh, mixture rate. This would produce continuous release of flammable atmosphere, leading to a runaway reaction. So this year, definitely we would require. Again, electrostatic is one of the uh, overlooked area in industry, in general. Increase in production storage of flammable. Uh, Waste because we might carry out all electrostatic assessment continuity in one location. And then if you increase your production, we might just bring back a new storage areas and, and then we, we would just keep continually using it. So earthing procedures may not be followed, improper sealing in storage and non uh, 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 unsuitable ATEX uh, motors or pumps could be used to, uh, to, to, to transfer the materials from the storage. So outcomes of a desire and ATEX review, whether it is valid, if the material is changed, obtain updated flammability data to ensure the basis of safety is achieved, ensure electric hazard are removed. If an inert system is changed, conduct further safety integrity level because that's a functional safety area. Changes of SOP, review ventilation characteristics and facility layout. If there is any questions, please feel free to uh, pop into a QA section and David will pick it up. Um, we will be happy to assist you. I hope you all enjoyed uh, the 40, 40 minutes to plus session and I managed to deliver as much as I can. Thank you. Dilip, well done. Really well done. A lot of very interesting slides and a large area to, to cover. Um, and I, I know amongst the questions, there's some really great ones, but some of them are very specific to individual operations, okay. which when I've looked at them, I've thought, oh, I could do a lot more information to answer that. So I think one of the things we'll try and do is capture those questions after okay. uh, and pass them to you. Okay. And if we can get permission from the individuals who raised it to IOSH, I'll work with Ben, maybe we can put you in touch with them to... Uh, to solve those, but sure. let's let's run through some. Uh, Rory Jackson's got, in fact, two questions. I think they both linked, but it shows how important 
bringing some of these elements down are. And he's saying, how do you actually know if a substance is flammable and how can you get it measured? And when you do, how do you then calculate and work out zone sizes that you referred to? So first, how do we know if something's flammable? So, uh, so if it depends on the materials, I would say honestly, if, if, the, if the materials are, uh, is it a liquid or a solvent, then you should get your uh, uh, flammable information from your suppliers as per the REACH regulation, the recent REACH regulations from 2021 in March, they have published that irrespective if it is a solvent or it is a dust or powders, your supplier should provide you their flammable properties. So if it is uh, any material that has flashpoint, uh, uh, you know, generally uh, less than uh, an ambient condition, it is quite sensitive and it is highly flammable or and any materials that comes under hydrocarbons are flammable materials, basically. So you would find that information in your safety data sheet. And if you have mixtures, the ACOP mentions the tests and the standards that you can refer to. Yes, and there are a number of companies around who will take samples and test them yes, for indeed. you. Yeah, indeed. Yes. Yeah. So there are companies that would uh, do this uh, for us. For example, if you are specifically from R&D, our pharma, our healthcare companies, our pesticides, or specialty chemicals, you can supply your material, say, from 100 milli to one liter, depends on the test you want to perform to the laboratory. They would carry out your flashpoint, your ignition, and LEL, UFL, if it is a liquid. Coming to dust, I believe people will also have the same questions coming from uh, food or dust or any metal industry. If you believe that your uh, powders are uh, uh, non-combustible, no, you should not just simply believe and you cannot simply take the information from Google because my uh, industry powders has differed to yours because the nature of operation to you uh, and to me is totally different. So we have to collect the samples from the dust collector because that's where you have the finest of the dust and we have to send it to the laboratory, which is ISO 257 aggregated laboratory. We do have quite a number in the UK and Europe and even worldwide. Uh, 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 that I can name a few, but uh, I'm not marketing. But yeah, so you, you, you we, we do, <laughs> and uh, we, you can send the samples to the laboratory. They come back to you whether uh, the materials are combustible or not by simply carrying out a test called Group A slash B. If it is the material is Group A, i.e., falling under the combustibility, then you have to move on following performing other uh, ignition sensitivity uh, information. Depends on your operations. Thanks for that. And what about, you mentioned a lot about zone zeros, one, two, 20, 21, 22. Yeah. If you uh, looking at that, how do you set the distances that the zone counts? How do you do your hazardous area drawings? So there, as I mentioned in the first, uh, the second, at the end of the second slides, uh, attendees, that you will all find the, the guidelines, uh, as I mentioned, EN6007, and uh, IP15, uh, and if the uh, audience are from India, you would find it that in ISO uh, uh, regulations. <clears throat> and in Europe, we have Ian again. There are worked out examples, right, from uh, fueling, from truck to tanker, submerged tankers, and overhead underground tankers, and process vessels, and reactors. And these are all only for the pressures that has been used uh, in, in normal industry. But if you tend to have uh, the pressures more than five bar, six and seven bar, then I would recommend that we have to carry out a dispersion, a leak analysis using software that would give you a clear uh, zones. But most of 90% of the industry and oil and gas and solvents, if you're using, they can pick it up the zones and extension of the zones, zero, one and two other scenarios from the standard. Thanks for that, David. Well, Paula Green's asked, um... Does disease apply to uh, healthcare premises? But before I give you the easy point, okay, indeed is yes. Do you want to sort of uh, go back and state that just because I've got a dangerous substance doesn't necessarily mean I have to comply with disease? Because Correct. that substance then has to give rise to the hazard. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't want people rushing off just because they've uh, no, no. they've got a substance. Go on, no. over to you, sir. Thank you, thank you, Dave. Thank you for highlighting, and it's really important to understand whether uh, I have a dangerous substances. But well, look, I have a toxic material. 
You don't need to do DZF for your toxic material. You have to do something else to protect your employees and workers from toxicity. And also from environment aspect, you have to carry out your assessment to protect from toxicity. So danger of substances, when you lit, when you ignite, it should burn or it should explode. So that is what we are talking here. And in healthcare, yes, healthcare, if you, if you use a, a powder that falls under, uh, again, uh, uh, combustibility, and if it is combustible, you have to carry your desire. But, but I believe you would have generally a natural gas passing through your facility for general heating, and you might have forklifts uh, that is assisting your warehouse for in and house logistics. Yes, then for these informations and materials, you have to carry your desire. But I would like to highlight, uh, uh, as Paul has raised a good common question. So any industry you use materials of natural gas for storage, not necessary that you have to perform your desire uh, that is totally on, uh, on the control of the installer, say uh, Calagas, or if it is National Grid, who is having their uh, natural gas incoming into your facility, they have to perform this year and uh, provide the report to you, uh, meaning because it is your asset, sorry, it's their asset, not yours. Uh, so before uh, going into rushing to perform a desire or uh, carrying out test, anyone who using dust, simply carry out a test called group A and B, right? And that will determine whether your material is uh, flammable or combustible. Uh, that is not expensive. It would cost you nearly only 300 to 400 quid. Uh, for your material uh, to be tested depends on how many materials you use within the facility. So if it is not combustible, then you're really good. Well, focus on exposure as that. That's it. Okay. Um, Susan Hutchinson raised a question. Mm -hmm. If you've had a disease assessment conducted in a site, yeah. would you normally expect there to be hazardous area drawings? I mean, come again, if you have disease uh, conducted in where? You've if you've had a disease assessment conducted of your site, okay, would you then normally expect to find zoning diagrams available? What I do to my clients is generally uh, I do uh, uh, determine the zones and we provide a table of tables uh, where is zone one and zone two and zone 20, 21, 22, and what is the reason? justification, how was, what is the distance and where I've taken reference from? Is it uh, from engineering uh, experience or from standards? But not necessarily that you will provide a drawings, but we would recommend a client to develop a drawing because to develop a drawing, it needs a lot of information. So may, it, you might need a CAD uh, file to have a 2D, two-dimensional two uh, uh, elevation to demonstrate how far is the, uh, the zone extends but we can also measure physically where the equipment is uh, based within the uh, uh, process room. We can measure and develop a basic uh, 2D uh, in the CAD and then give a hatching from a vent, a duct or a flanges, uh, what is a zone. But I would recommend, uh, I believe the question is from Mohammed. you said? Yeah. And uh, it, it I would generally recommend the client, uh, my clients and everybody to develop your hazardous area classification because this would help you in your hard work permit because unless and until you don't know where is your hazardous areas are present, how are you providing your hard work permit and you're signing the document, right? So in yeah. order to effectively know my hazardous area and it is best to incorporate your hazardous area drawings with your hard work permit so the contractor knows where he is going and what he's after. And you also know where he's doing, what he's doing and what material you're using within the facility. So it is important to develop a drawing. I generally give, the EE provides a table, but if you want additionally, we can develop a hazardous area classification table. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Susan also asked um, or stated that they have a mobile um, LEV, local exhaust ventilation unit which is used to remove flour, icing sugar from a, a pilot plant area mm -hmm. or pilot plant weighing area. Yeah. And she says, would this be classified as zone 20 for dust handling? So now you have the operation and you have the actual mobile LEV. Yeah. How would you go about assessing uh, the zoning requirements in that pilot plant? 
yeah so this is slightly we are moving away from uh, jazia it's more of dust exposure yes it falls under jazia so when you have a mobile lev and my major concern is not the lev i'm much worried about the dust collector because uh, you are collecting multiple uh, dust uh, uh, into one dust collector so we are not sure what is the ignition sensitivity uh, of the material that is being handled so that is kind of uh, uh, genuinely uh, a concern to me but coming back to lev if it is a continuous process and if it is a dedicated process line why do you not have a dedicated lev because uh, by by installing a dedicated lev we are removing a big threat because um, uh, and also uh, i'm not sure what is the wheels of the mobile lev is it nylon they are not earthed you constantly move them you constantly move from one end to another end they are constantly charged and then when you tip or when you rip your 25 kilo sack back into your station and then you're creating a dust cloud that is zone zone 21 to answer simply because the cloud is present between the uh, the receiving vessel and this mobile living that this area yeah. and outside 1.5 meter is zone 21 i would say until the floor because you know we know how the dust act they just settle down like a cloud until the previous floor level so it's zone 21 and uh, and also additionally i would recommend just do not use mobile lev i know it's cost effective but the threat is high and i would recommend to uh, to have uh, uh, i mean uh, a, a separate lev or a dedicatedly installed lev for all the uh, uh, materials Great, Philip. Thanks so much for that. Um, we now just passed the uh, the hour which we've committed to. There are other questions that, as I say, we can pass on to you and see if we can connect. Yeah. Uh, I've got. I know Tom Chambers is uh, is is online with us. I just want to thank Tom for connecting us with you and for his hard work of getting this uh, uh, this webinar up and around. And just ask everybody to keep a. Um, an eye open for the, the next webinars that we're going to run okay. and i look forward to chatting to you in the future to not only thank you for this but to follow up on some of these questions it's been a great talk i found it absolutely fascinating thanks so much for uh, for being present thank you okay very much. everyone thank, thank, you, thank everyone. you for joining yep thank you all for joining us today and for iosh for for running this and we look through the polls and the feedback we always do and I look forward to welcoming you again in the future to uh, one of the hazardous industry group sessions. Nice. So that's all for now. And thank you. Take thank care. you. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Bye bye.